Good morning. Today is Sunday, May 14th, 2023. This Friday, May 19th, is Yom Yerushalayim, celebrating the reunification of Jerusalem in the Six-Day War in 1967. I've shared the first part of this with you before. The Talmud says that the land of Israel is higher than any other place in the world, and Jerusalem is the highest spot in the land of Israel. And that, we see, is inferred in a pasuk, in a verse, where the Torah says, the kamta v'alisa el hamakom asheyivchar Hashem, you will rise up and ascend to the place that God will choose, meaning Jerusalem. You see that it's higher because you have to rise up. You have to ascend in order to get there. We ask the question, Rabbi Shlomo Aviner asked the question, wait a second, there are places much taller than Jerusalem. First of all, even in Israel, there's Har Chemon, which is the highest mountain in Israel. It's certainly higher than Jerusalem. And second of all, there are many places in the world that have taller mountains in Israel. Mount Everest is certainly taller than, than any place in Israel. How in the world can we say that Israel is the highest place? So there are a number of different answers to this question. But I shared with you before the approach of the Chassam Sofer, who has a very different approach from all the others. And he says as follows. He says, the earth is a sphere. There is no part that is higher than the other. It just depends how you hold it. If you hold it so that Israel is on top, then Israel is the highest. If you turn it, then Israel is not the highest. And explains the Chassam Sofer what the, what the Talmud means when it says the land of Israel is the highest land and Jerusalem is, la, is the highest place, it means that we have an obligation, we have a responsibility as Jews to hold the world so that Israel and Jerusalem is at the top. That is in our minds, in our prayers, in our emotions, in our view of the world, we should view the world as Israel on top, as Jerusalem on top. The essential job of the Jew is to have the proper perspective, to look at the world and our place in it with Jerusalem at the top. And that is the mission for Yom Yerushalayim and every day, but Yom Yerushalayim enforces this, to be able to hold the world in such a way to have the perspective that the top the most important, the central place is Israel, and at the very pinnacle is Jerusalem. Okay, I shared that with you before. Now I'd like to add something new. Today I want to add a fascinating consequence of this. In 1941, several hundred yeshiva students and teachers from Mir in Poland and some other places, traveled east to escape the Nazi persecution. They traveled all the way across Russia and they went as far as Kobe, Japan. A little bit later, most of them settled in Shanghai, in China. But when they reached Kobe, Japan, they realized that they may have crossed the international date line. And so they didn't know what to do. Some started to observe two days of Shabbos. Okay, two days of Shabbos is not the most difficult. But what happens when it comes to two days of Yom Kippur? If you're not sure what day it is, how could you possibly keep two days of Yom Kippur? And this is the first modern uh, 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 instance where this question came up for a significant group of 
Torah observant Jews who wanted to know what they did, to, wanted to know what to do. So what they did was they corresponded with the major halakhic authorities at that time in Israel and in Europe, whoever they could reach, to try to determine what does Jewish law say about the international dateline. This is a fascinating discussion. It's extremely complex. Basically, there are at least 13 different opinions about where the date line should be in accordance with Jewish law. I'd like to share with you this morning very briefly three. The three foremost, most discussed, most considered opinions about where the date line is. The first opinion is the opinion of the Chazon Ish, Rabbi Avram Karelitz, who lived in Bnei Brak, one of the great halachic authorities in the early years of the state of Israel. He places the line 90 degrees east of Jerusalem. The second opinion I want to share is the opinion of Rav Tzvi Pesach Frank. He was a very important rabbi in Jerusalem at that time. He accepts the international date line. And the third opinion I want to share is the opinion of Rabbi Yechiel Michal Tukachinsky, a great scholar in Jewish law, and he sets the place as 180 degrees opposite Jerusalem, meaning the exact opposite of Jerusalem. Let's start with the Chazonish. The Talmud says, in former times when the Holy Temple was standing in Jerusalem and there was a Sanhedrin, a Gadol, a great court, the way that Rosh Chodesh was established was based on eyewitnesses. So it'd be nighttime, eyewitnesses would see the new moon in the sky, and the next day they would come to the Sanhedrin, to the great court in Jerusalem, and they would testify. We saw the new moon in the sky, and it was in this place and facing this way, and the judges knew what questions to ask in order to ascertain if they were telling the truth. And then, once the judges were satisfied by cross-examining all the witnesses, they would proclaim, Makudish, 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 today is sanctified as Rosh Chodesh, which means that Rosh Chodesh was sanctified sometime during the day. And of course, that would be retroactive till the beginning of the day, because that would establish what day, which day is day number one of the month. So that means retroactively last night was the actual beginning of this Rosh Chodesh, the first day, the first night of this month. The Talmud says that the Sanhedrin could only proclaim Rosh Chodesh at today as Rosh Chodesh if they did so by noon in Jerusalem. If for whatever reason the witnesses didn't get there in time, there were too many witnesses they didn't finish examining them, for whatever reason, if, it were, if, if, the, if that day had already gone into afternoon, then that day could not be proclaimed Rosh Chodesh. It had to be proclaimed as the next day, Rosh Chodesh. Why? So some of the commentaries explain as follows. Because at the moment that Rosh Chodesh was announced in Jerusalem, it was going to be retroactive in Jerusalem to the night before. But it had to be announced so that at least somewhere in the world, it was still Rosh Chodesh. Somewhere it would be beginning Rosh Chodesh, meaning in Jerusalem it was going to be ret retroactive. But there had to be some place in the world where the proclamation in Jerusalem at noon would mean that there was some place in the world where Rosh Chodesh would be announced at the beginning of that date. Noon in Jerusalem is sunset 90 degrees east of Jerusalem. So therefore, the Chazonish says that that line, 90 degrees east of Jerusalem, that's the international date line. And that's where the day starts for the world. 
And so as you go around and you're crossing the Pacific and it gets earlier and earlier that come to that point, it's now a different day. Now, one problem with this is that that line, 90 degrees east of Jerusalem, runs through China. And it would be an absurd consequence if within one city that lies on that land, that, that line, that it could be one day on this side of the street and another day on the other side of the street. What that would mean is if you had a Jewish family that was living in that town, they could start Shabbos on the eastern side of the street and then immediately cross the street and they could do Havdalah. Or they could, just before Shabbos, be on the west side of the street. And then, it's Friday, Shabbos didn't start. And then they cross the street to the east side. Shabbos is over. They didn't have any Shabbos. So that's absurd. And therefore, what the Chazoni said is, it's generally the line of 90 degrees east of Jerusalem, except it follows the eastern coast. So all of China is to the west. It follows the eastern coast of China and of Australia. But anything east of that is the other side of the date line. So that means, for example, Japan, New Zealand, Hawaii are all east of the international date line in terms of Jewish law, and they will be keeping days different on the east side than on the west side. Keep in mind, this applies to many, many different mitzvahs. It applies to counting the Omer. How in the world are you going to count the Omer if you're going back and forth? Which day do you count? Okay, that's one opinion. <clears throat> Second opinion I want to share is the opinion of Tzvi Pesach Rank. And he says that Jewish law recognizes the international date line now overseen by the United Nations, which sees Greenwich, England as the starting point. And the international date line is 180 degrees exactly opposite Greenwich, England. <clears throat> A number of other great halakhic authorities agree with him. Rabbi Isazam and Meltzer, the greatest halakhic authority in Europe, and Rav Moshe Feinstein, greatest halakhic authority in North America, perhaps in the world. They agreed, follow the international date line assumed by the secular sources. Why? I mean, how? Sh why should that have any impact on Jewish law? That was an arbitrary line drawn. But it's much deeper because what Rav Frank is really saying is you follow the community that is living there. The people that are living in Hawaii, in Japan, etc., in China, they all have a day that they call Saturday. And the people living there observe Shabbos on the day that they call Saturday. So if I'm traveling, even if the idea of me crossing the international date line according to different authorities might mean I should keep a day different than them, no, you keep what the people there keep. How do they establish it? They establish it based on the international date line. That's what is assumed in Hawaii. Everybody has Saturday is Saturday. Nobody says Saturday is Friday. Nobody says Saturday is Sunday. Saturday is Saturday. So that's when you keep Shabbos. That's when you fast on Yom Kippur. That's when you count the Omer, etc. According to this opinion, Hawaii is east of the date line, the halakhic date line. New Zealand and Japan are west, just like China and Australia. You see, it makes a very big difference according to which opinion you follow. But let me share one third opinion. The opinion of Rabbi Yechiel Michal Tukachinsky. He says, the halachic date line is 180 degrees opposite Jerusalem. The exact opposite of Jerusalem. Why? Because Jerusalem lies in the center of 
of the world. Or to use the words in the Gemara that I quoted, at the top of the world. There must be a center, a starting point, a focal point from which to measure. And Rav, Rav Tukhachinsky says it is intuitive. It is obvious, right? If you're holding the world, if you're looking at the world such that Jerusalem is at the very top, that that is the starting point. It's intuitive. And therefore... The opposite will be 180 degrees from Jerusalem. Now, this means that Hawaii is west of the date line. Just like Japan and New Zealand and China and Australia. Now, that line 180 degrees west of Jerusalem also runs through Alaska. But here, through Alaska, Rav Tukachinsky says the same thing that Kazonish said about his opinion, and that is you cannot have the line going through cities. And therefore, according to Rav Tukachinsky, Alaska is east of the date line, and you follow the western coast of Alaska, and then below Alaska, it goes straight down 180 degrees east of Jerusalem. Which means, by the way, that there is a difference of opinion what day is Shabbos in Hawaii and Japan and New Zealand. But the point I want to make is the opinion of Rav Tukachinsky. Why does he hold that opinion? Because according to Rav Tukachinsky, the idea that we started with it is obvious and intuitive that we must hold the world, we must look at the world so that Jerusalem is at the top. And therefore, since there must be an international date line, it has to be calculated from Jerusalem, 180 degrees east of Jerusalem. Rav Tukchinsky concludes, Jerusalem is our Greenwich. If you're going to have a spot which is the prime meridian, the center focal point, that's got to be Jerusalem. Now, there is no clear consensus on this halachic issue. There is, practically speaking, a plethora of opinions given by different modern halachic authorities. And the subject, with all of its halachic consequences, it is dizzying in how complicated it is, and it's become much more relevant in modern times, especially with people so frequently traveling back and forth regarding prayer and Shabbos and counting the Omer and Yom Tov and Yom Kippur and so many aspects of Jewish law. It's very, very complicated to figure out what to do. But it is fascinating to me to see, in the opinion of Rav Tukhachinsky, a practical halachic consequence of this principle of the Chassam Sofer to view Jerusalem not only spiritually but physically as the top or center of the world. My friends, I wish you a good day and I look forward to seeing you all soon in person.